before I start, I want to give credit to these amazing people who helped me with this video. Uh, there's this person on ShareLib whose name I would say, but I would butcher it because it's in Chinese. And anyway, um, much of the appearance analysis and the historical analysis is done by them. I asked them for permission before I use their information. It's in Chinese. I translated it over and they gave me permission. It's really good stuff. Go check them out if you can. And then uh, we have Mayo Sailor on Twitter who did amazing translations for basically anything from the game you could ever want, like Twitter translations, deduction translations, anything. Check them out below. I have a link for all of them if you want to see it. Acrobat introduction! Mike Morton is the most popular guy in the traveling circus, Hullabaloo. After surviving the disaster, Mike Morton's only goal is to find the real killer who destroyed his home. Bubbly blonde haired, a lively spirit, and clear blue eyes forever full of joy, Mike Morton was the most popular guy in Hullabaloo the traveling circus. I like how they specify that twice, like you didn't know. Um, Hullabaloo was Mike's entire world, a world where slaughter should never have happened. Having survived from the tragedy, Mike would stop at nothing until he finds the one responsible for shattering his world. Yes, queen. This research analysis will include a brief history of acrobatics, the relationship between Mike and another lesser known character, Bernard. It's not pedophilia, sorta. Hear me out when we get to that point. And the relationship between water, ammonium nitrate, and camel dung. Yes, I said that right. Multiple bomb projection methods, and Mike's relationship with Joker and other characters. Hoo-wee, that's a lot of stuff. Because the relationship between Mike and Moonlit River Massacre and the circus is pretty complicated, the specific analysis for that will be at a different date, but a lot of information in that will be included here. If you hear boisterous laughing, uh, I would ask you to ignore that, please. That is the people outside of my dorm uh, by the pool. They're not doing weed today, which is nice because they usually do weed and that's bad. I mean, I'm not, not like, it, it, not that weed's bad. I'm not getting political here. I mean, like, don't do it outside of my room. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's start with Mike Morton's design. I think a character's design is really important to understanding more about the character and in Mike's case, that is pretty true. Um, the details of his design hold a lot of interesting secrets. So let's start with his bodysuit, which is pretty simple overall. It is a character of a Harley Quinn or Archelino, probably butchered that pronunciation. Um, it came from an improvised theater of 16th century Italy, and it was a wily and unscrupulous servant whose clothes were covered in patches. His face was covered with a black half mask, which also had a bushy mustache and whiskery beard. Through the centuries, this outfit became increasingly stylized, with patches becoming a regular diamond pattern overall. Historically speaking, these patchworks were worn in this form of way as a form of challenge or religious blasphemy in the Middle Ages. As stated in Leviticus 19, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Uh, as a side note, you're probably going to be confused as to why this law has not continued today. To explain, this is regarded as most in, in most Christian denominations as ceremonial law, which belongs to the Old Testament. It includes things like not eating certain foods, marking one's body, cutting one's hair, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Corinthians and Acts both explain that these laws are either set aside or nullified. So um, while this is not necessarily still a part of the religion, it was set as tradition for quite a long time. So especially during the Middle Ages when people were going around living by day to day and they saw people not following these rules, it was a bit weird to them, which shows why these designs were the way they were. It was meant to be, it was meant to be taboo. It was meant to be worn by lunatics or something. To put it simply, the court jesters is a symbol of madness and immorality in and of itself. Now, all of this could have been inspiration for Mike's design, or it could have been that they found an image on public domain and they copied it. Like, almost exactly. I'm not saying they did that, but oh, come on. They did that. Look at this. Okay, whatever. Now for the hat. So the origin of this type of hat is actually really old, and it can be traced back to the nomadic minority Figurian, I'm butcher, P-H-R-Y-G-I-A-N-S, I can't pronounce that, who are living in what is now Turkey. They were then introduced into the Persian Empire. Later, the Persians invaded Greece and brought this hat to the Greece area, and then it was introduced to Rome with the war between Greece and Rome, and it flourished in the 2nd and 4th centuries. It then gradually disappeared in the destruction of paganism by the Christian revival. Now, probably because of their dissatisfaction with Christianity, the former believers added the meaning of freedom to this little hat as a way of kind of going against Christianity, I guess you could say. Wearing this hat essentially means yearning for freedom, and by the time of the French Revolution, this little hat became a representative image of the working class, and its image can be seen in many oil paintings today. 
Yeah, hats are cool, but you know what's really cool? Balls. Juggling balls. So juggling is a skill, and there's a whole bunch of different types of balls people use when juggling. Mike has a pretty special one called beanbags, which at the time was one of the most common ones. So because juggling is a skill and there's so many different types of balls, we have to talk about what's used for what. So because he uses beanbags, which are preferred by, as I said before, a lot of people, they don't really bounce or roll when they're dropped, and they're mostly just caught pretty easily. They're not damaging, it's not like they have anything super dangerous in there, and they're basically for beginners. So stage balls are often used by performance jugglers, not these types of beanbag ones. Now, these ones have a polished outer shell, typically made of plastic or harder rubber, and are usually are hollow. In the mid-19th century, rubber was used for these sorts of things often, so it's interesting that Mike would opt for the beanbag one instead. Now, it's possible that he simply never wanted to upgrade to a more sophisticated prop. I mean, as we're gonna discuss later on, he's basically like a kid. Like, dude, this guy is more childish than Explorer. Okay, but whatever. Um, but it could also be that he simply still saw himself as a beginner for quite some time and didn't really feel ready to upgrade. But enough about that, because I know why you're really here. Now, I'm actually, real talk, really surprised that no one in NAU has found this. Of course, I know this uh, person in China found it because that's where I found this information, so I know they have found it, but no one in the NAU, which is weird. So I implore you, if you haven't done this yet, compare, um, compare Mike's ears to every other survivor's. Just, just do it real fast. What? What the fuck? What the hell is even that? His ears finna thick, okay? They're, f they're swollen. An analysis of every other survivor reveals that this is only present with him. This isn't just an unimportant detail either. There is a very strong possibility that Mike has what is known as cauliflower ear. Cauliflower ear is a deformity of the outer ear that may occur after injury to the ear. It may occur when blood that collects in the outer ear after an injury isn't drained properly and then it becomes, you know, infected. Common causes include sports, wrestling, boxing, martial arts, all that type of physical jazz. You know, Mike may not have practiced fighting, but it is possible that he stepped on a ball, harmed himself, falling down, or, you know, he's an acrobat. Sure, acrobatics at the time mostly included juggling, but He's a pretty risky guy. I wouldn't be surprised if he did something that got himself hurt. Okay, so we've done his physical appearance. Now I want to go talk about his name real fast. There's nothing super important here or amazing, but I like to go over it just to, you know, just because. The name Mike is pretty boring. There's nothing special about it. But the name Morton, um, it's a very English name. It comes from the Nordic area. So you know, Nordic men tend to have white skin, freckles. Um, blonde hair, not all blonde, but similar tones, and, you know, Mike, he checks down all these boxes, so it's very likely that he's a purebred Englishman, which is interesting because other characters in the lore, such as Dancer, they appear to be from different areas joining the circus, not necessarily from, you know, England. For example, I think Dancer is Dutch based off of her surname and, you know, her childhood residence, so that's not super important, but, you know, might as well include that. Now for the background of acrobatics itself. So in the Victorian era, it was very different from today. The job of acrobatics was to delay the time between musical performances by tossing and catching the ball in front of the curtain. In other words, their, you know, their job was pretty similar to a circus clown. They pretty much just delay for like the interesting and fun stuff going on. In other words, the actor position Mike held in the circus at the time was not really that important and could even be described as pretty ordinary. Of course, he is certainly not satisfied with this arrangement. As an example of this, just look at his cauliflower ears. Multiple falls and friction can cause this type of damage, and it can be seen that he may have tried other types of performances that were more dangerous to get this higher up position. However, Bernard, who his, is his adoptive father, we'll get to that later, probably denied him this and was like, no dude, that's dangerous, we're not letting you do this. I mean, Acrobat does have a pretty dangerous streak in him. Considering how he tries to alter his juggling balls by making them catch fire and using dangerous chemicals, um, I would say maybe he's not satisfied with how good his performance is right now. Um, just, an, uh, just a crazy idea right there. Guess what? It's camel dong time. Yay! You, you were excited about that. Okay, so uh, picking into Mike's deduction, we see his 
odd shopping list. Um, niter, <laughs> camel dung, milk, and eggs. Classic daily stuff you buy, you know? Okay, so to decipher this, let's first look at the ammonium nitrate. From the historical setting, there are two ways for Mike to attain um, nitrate, which is to either buy the industry-produced fertilizer at that time, or do it yourself. Yeah, boy. Now, ammonium nitrate in fertilizer is definitely limited, and from the deduction depicting cold hands caused by the reaction, the ammonium nitrate used by Mike was most likely pretty high in purity. Now, at the time, the method of making ammonium nitrate was usually the reaction of sodium nitrate and ammonium sulfate. Your ass, I hated chemistry. I still hate chemistry. I'm just reading what this stuff says. So if it's wrong, forgive me. Um, Google and Wikipedia helped me out here. But anyway, considering that these elements obtain in camel manure, the equation for making ammonium nitrate by Mike might be something like this. Please, I hope I got this right. Um, that That is it right there. But the equation has a bigger problem. That is, where does the ammonium come from? After all, before the Haber method was produced in 1903, which was um, pressurizing the alloy in the steel reactor so that the pressurization can make it do the thing. It, it, the pressur it pressurizes the stuff, okay? That's what it is. Um, but before, at this time, they didn't really have a good way of doing that. Now, there is actually a solution, and that is manure. A stinky solution, you could say. Now, this um, organic matter has a higher nitrogen content than plant organic matter. At the same time, the nitrogen containing organic matter in human and animal feces is very unstable and easily decomposes into ammonia, which is the, um, the thing that smells bad. After a certain treatment, it can become ammonia nitrogen, which is then in the form of free ammonia and ammonium ions in the water. Basically, you use the, the stuff to make the thing for the bombs, okay? I don't like chemistry. Um, after attaining all this through the special method, you pour the acid directly into the ammonium nitrate, and although the process is a bit, <laughs> a bit disgusting, it is indeed feasible. As for what ammonium nitrate is used for, due to its water absorbing and heat absorbing properties, it may be used as the cooling bomb in the game. Now, of course, the chemical path of camel dung may be much more uh, different than all this stuff, mixing with reducing agents and a whole bunch of other stuff, you know? Now, but regardless of how this stuff is working, he's trying to make these types of chemicals which you can use in the bombs he's juggling with. Now, this is a... We're going to take a dark turn right here. You most likely heard of the Bruit explosion on August 4th of this year, 2020. Lebanese authorities reported the death toll of over 200 people left injured more than 5,000 and 300,000 people are homeless now. Yeah. Not fun. Very, very sad, actually. The disaster was caused by 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, which accidentally caught fire. Now, you've probably seen the videos online of just how intense this explosion was and dangerous, and this explosive substance is the same stuff Mike is using. So, yeah, um, not a, not a smart idea, but yeah. In the end, there are clay bombs. It may be pretty simple to make. Mix the milk and eggs together and then add the camel dung. Now, this is assuming he's using all the ingredients on the shopping list together. He may just be wanting to have, you know, a nice cup of milk and eggs while he's doing all this stuff. Who knows? Now, this is all just speculation, of course, but this would be able to make a form of the clay bomb and the fire bomb and the ice bomb, depending on how he puts this stuff together. Now, why would you use camel dung specifically? Wouldn't it be easier just to get other type of dung? Well, here's the thing. Camels are long distance travelers um, and they tend to eat desert hay. And as a result, their feces are usually pretty dry. And after a period of time, they will become a sort of white powder, which is easier to accept visually and tolerate by the nose, you know? It is true that camel dung is also contained in Chinese medicine, <laughs> fun which can be used for external use to treat nosebleeds. Fun. <laughs> to sum up, there may be places selling this stuff in circuses or areas nearby, and I mean, hey, if you have to choose a sort of, if you have to make a chemical bomb, 
using using feces i mean you might as well go with the animal that at least doesn't smell as bad i'm just saying but fern i hear you say how do we know the time period okay now this may seem weird but hear me out we need to use time period identifiers and the first one is his beard Okay, so when Mike was adopted by Bernard, who we'll talk about later, he mentions an interesting point in his deduction, which is, <clears throat> my, my quote voice, a middle-aged man with a mustache is standing in front of the circus tent holding a blonde little boy. Now, the Victorian period was a very special period for men's beards. During the period, growing beards became a trend among men, and there were even a series of pamphlets and books that warned the Victorian public about the dangers of shaving. For example, greasing men who turn their backs on religion and shaving could cause cancer. Ooh. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it makes a lot of sense that we would see facial hair from around the 1870s to 1890s especially, which can help us uh, pinpoint the time a little bit. Next, we're going to talk about the roller coaster. That's right, buddy boy. Uh, Moonlit River Park, you got the cool roller coaster. So in 1885, Philip Hinkle. I love that last name, by the way. Hinkle. Hinkle. That's a beautiful name. Introduced the first complete circuit roller coaster with a lift hill. The Gravity Pleasure Road was the name of the place. Now, this began to be a pretty popular attraction at Coney Island, and not to be outdone, in 1886, Lamarcus Adana. Why can't people have easy to pronounce names? Thompson pat patented his design for a roller coaster. So the patent was around 1886. So we must assume that um, the the actual roller coaster we see has to be from maybe a bit later around that time, which gives us a bit more context for when this could have occurred. And finally, ammonium nitrate. Back at it again with good old ammonium nitrate. Whew. So, after talking about the unreliable roller coaster, we have the most reliable clue for the time period, the generalization of ammonium nitrate knowledge. Now, the substance first made artificially in 1659 by German chemist John Ruf Rudolf Galbert? German. I love Germans. I do. I can't pronounce anything. I'm an idiot. Forgive me. But until the end of the 19th century, the explosive powder of ammonium nitrate was not discovered until the end of the First World War. Until 1914, natural nitrates were the most important source of production for fertilizers and explosives. Beginning in 1883, the main nitrate reservoirs were controlled by Chile, which produced almost 80% of the world's nitrogen. Now, the First World War spurred Germany to develop synthetic nitrogen, which ended Chile's monopoly over world nitrates. Ammonium nitrate can be great in producing fertilizers and other products, but these resources were held under a monopoly at the time. The War of the Pacific, also known as the Saltpeter War, was a war between Chile and Bolivian-Peruvian alliances from 1879 to 1884. It was fought over Chilean claims on the nitrate-rich coast of the Bolivian territory. After the war, Peru was defeated and the monopoly was ended, and Europe was finally able to get their hands on Chilean nitrates. Yay! The war lasted from April 5th, 1879 to August 20th, 1883, and finally stopped completely in 1884. Essentially, after 1884, European countries, including the United Kingdom, attained a stable source of Chilean saltpeter. Previously in 1878, Bolivia had taken the British Mining Company station there by force, which prevented Britain from importing a large amount of cheap saltpeter. After the Saltpeter War, through industrialization, the knowledge of ammonium nitrate was widely dispersed. Now, prior to this war, saltpeter was not really used a lot except for maybe in educational instances and circumstances. Mike was not the smartest bulb in the box. I don't think he's going to some fancy school, okay? So I find it very unlikely that he would even find out about this until after the war took place. Now, because of that, the time inference here, which is not really that significant for Mike's story, but is very significant for a wilding story spoiler spoiler alert um but it should be around 1883 and he may have been adopted by bernard at around 1868 which means that he bernard bernard would have been around 35 to 50 and he probably died in the massacre at around 50 to 65. again not important to mike's story but very important to wildings okay spoiler um but that's that's all for that part now we have the actual story analysis okay so from my general outline script i'm on page 10 of 26 let's go <clears throat> deduction one he's like a father an ideal one 
Photo 1. A middle-aged man with a mustache is carrying a boy with blonde hair in front of a circus tent. Now, we don't know exactly what Mike's life background is, but according to historical context at the time, he's probably a child whose parents died when he was still young, leaving him abandoned and left in an orphanage. The formal child adoption bill in the United Kingdom was not introduced until 1920s. Previously, as long as someone had enough status and money, it was a pretty simple matter for them to adopt an orphan, unless the child had relatives or something, but that's getting into specifics. Now, Bernard's purpose for adopting Mike at the time isn't really known. It may have been to train him into a profitable circus member, which is unlikely considering Bernard in later deductions, or it may have been for other purposes. At the very least for Mike, Bernard filled the hole in his heart where his father figure would be. As for the age which he was adopted, considering his preliminary judgment of things, it was probably around six to eight years old, and you know, growing up in a circus since childhood, it's no wonder Mike considers this place to be his home. As far as the circus tent is concerned in this deduction, the noisy circus was already established at the time and should have had some sort of reputation. As mentioned in the Moon River background story, the noisy circus is a mobile circus, which was rather common at the time. It's the next day. I have myself a piece of bread. I'm ready to go. Deduction 2, the secret of juggling. Throwing isn't just an interesting skill, it's what makes a juggler successful. Diary 1. Bernard said that the size and shape of the bag, as well as the type of filling, are critical. He refused my request to fill the bag with stone, stating that it was too hazardous. After Mike grew up a little bit, Bernard began to help Mike work more as an actor, teaching him how to do juggling and other types of skills. This was also most likely the time where Mike's reputation as, quote, the most likable guy in the circus came into fruition, probably due to his dedication to his craft and his potential. Now, we can also see in this area the close-knit relationship between Bernard and Mike. The circus was established by Bernard, and as the manager of the circus, his position in it is probably going to be the most important one. However, he's willing to let go of his identity to personally teach Mike how to juggle, and takes extra caution to prevent him from hurting himself by filling the things with stones, because Mike is an idiot. I'm sorry, it's true. Bernard has indeed devoted much of his time and attention to Mike, showing that he definitely has a favorable spot for him in his heart. Deduction 3. The Form of Art Creativity is what ensures that the stage performance continues to improve. Notebook, the properties of NIDER and some test records are recorded in detail. As Mike grew older, he became interested in enhancing the form of his performance. At this time, he may have been a few years away from full adulthood, but he still should have been old enough to take care of himself, so around 16 or 17. In the process of growing up, Mike may have tried other forms of performances other than juggling that didn't really stick with him that well. Based off of his appearance, it's likely that he gained some form of injuries, such as the cauliflower ears. Perhaps other performances were either too dangerous for him and stopped by Bernard, or he may just not have been good at them, such as potentially with humorous types of acts. So he ended up serving as an active acrobat between stages, although he gradually became dissatisfied with this position. It is important to understand that at the time, acrobats and circuses were really not that important, and they were likely to be replaced at any time. Mike may have had Bernard's approval, but of course it's natural that he would be uneasy about this. Mike began to experiment with ways to enhance his performance by thinking outside the box, and with explosives. Mike, you're crazy. Please don't. He didn't want to be someone who just appeared in between acts, he wanted to be the act. In short, he wanted to be a valuable part of the show, which is commonly referred to as being a pillar in the direct translations. So if you ever see someone say, this person was the pillar of the show in relation to like this translation section, they're talking about that, like being important to the show. We'll get more to that later. Uh, as, for why, why, as for why Mike has this idea, it's well understood in combination with his relationship with Bernard. As a child adopted by a circus manager, the best way to make his adopter father happy is to make himself appear in the surface, circus and to be important and useful. Basically, kind of like Violetta's approach, except for, you know, Violetta's a special bean. We're gonna say that. But as far as the results concerned, Mike's attempts have failed, and may have even been stopped by Bernard himself due to how stupidly dangerous he is. Mike, please stop it, you're stupid. Anyway, this deduction provides more insight into the relationship between Bernard and Mike. To give a little bit of a spoiler from Wilding's point of view, or I mean, you could always read the deductions yourself, Wilding sees Bernard as a really bad guy. Uh, Bernard plays the role of someone who would torture his nephew for decades for the sake of money and fame, even at the expense of letting him play a literal wilding, like savage, on stage. So wilding does not like this guy. Therefore, from his perspective, it would be far more reliable to consider his motives in terms of monetary benefits. 
Okay, so thinking about it from this perspective, Bernard adopted Mike for money or for fame. However, this is not true. Because if we look at the deductions with Mike, as Bernard's adopted son, Mike has been playing an unimportant role for 10 years or more in the circus. Mike is not indispensable, and he doesn't really bring in any extra money or benefit. On the other hand, Bernard did not force Mike to conduct these dangerous experiments that he's doing. Instead, he allowed him to conduct these costly chemical experiments that are not cheap and should not be able to be afforded on an acrobat's salary. With this in mind, it's really logical to assume that he got this money from Bernard, as that's his parental figure. So Bernard's current attitude toward Mike violates the concept we see in Wilding's deduction, which is that he's doing it for money and fame, because he's not getting fame and he's losing money. So it really makes more sense that he's doing this out of an own form of care for Mike, an actual like father-son relationship. I will say uh, there's a lot of theories about whether Bernard changed after what happened with Wilding or not. That's going to be addressed more in Wilding stuff, and I will address that a little bit more later on. Deduction 4. New Faces The circus was where people come and go. We always welcome new faces, and obviously the beautiful ones. Yeah. It's at this point in the story where Mike's story officially meets with Jokers and the others. So Mike's age continues to grow, in which he meets Sergi and female dancer, aka Natalie, aka at this point in time, Animal Tamer. Real fast, if you did not know, Dancer has three names, three aliases, which we'll get into later, but for now just know that she is female dancer, and we can see this because the Animal Tamer is blonde, which corresponds to the blonde girl, and we know that they're the same person from other deductions from other characters, which I won't get into today. But during this time, and a little bit before this time, one of the most prominent acts in the circus probably would have been taken by Joker, aka he would have been the pillar of the circus. See, I told you we were going to get back to that term. Now, the circus was probably pretty famous for him. However, with the passage of time, people have become a bit tired of his form of comics, and Joker's popularity would not have been as popular as it was before. Perhaps out of consideration for adding fresh blood, Bernard asks Sergi and Natalie to join the circus, and Mike also welcomes them to join wholeheartedly. In fact, some of Mike's values can be seen here. He's very interested in this new form of circus, but he's also not really that concerned about the decline of the old one. The circus is home for Mike's heart, but he understands that there are necessary rules. For example, old members who are losing popularity must give way to new members. For the circus, the collective is more important than the individual. Na, 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 na. Alright, <laughs> of course, uh, beautiful actors in the circus are generally popular, and Mike is a handsome boy himself, although I've said it before, I'll say it again, Jose is still the hottest survivor, don't at me, and it seems that his appearance may have given Mike more of his infinity towards Sergi and Natalie, but for Joker, who retired, Mike really never noticed him as much in the past, so it seems that Mike is favoring these two more, although he never really gets super close with them. Deduction 5, Deer. Alright, I'm gonna warn you. We're gonna, we're gonna delve into this one a little bit more later because there are some interesting theories about this deduction in particular, but we'll get to that part when we get there. As for now, let's deal with the surface of it. How people call each other often reflects the degree to which the relationship has developed. Diary 2. I love niter. As long as it's mixed with water, even a hot summer day can become refreshing. Bernard's reaction was hilarious, and he even called me Dear Mr. Mike Morton. Oh, Bernard, I want to hear it again. Next time I'll make sure to put my cold hands down your collar. Uh, important note, uh, Michael Morton does not drink the ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate in water is an overall endothermic reaction, meaning that the chemical mixture absorbs heat from the atmosphere, making it feel cold. By being nice and cool, Mike is just mixing the chemicals together and they're absorbing the heat from his hands, meaning that that makes it cold. This deduction does not mean that he drinks chemicals. He's stupid, but he's not that stupid, okay? Okay. Really fast, there's a whole, whole, whole lot of special theories about this deduction, but for the seriousness of this analysis, I will leave that part to the Mike and Bernard relationship, which we'll get into later. Here, Mike should be an adult, but he's not even recognized by his adoptive father as one. He is obviously still seen as a child by many people because of his temperament and his personality. Now, of course, in addition to showing the extremely close relationship between Mike and Bernard, this section has an interesting detail. Mike is very happy because Bernard calls him, quote, Mr. Combining the previous deductions, we know that Mike Morton is a person who is extremely eager to be recognized by Bernard and has a pretty childish personality. 
He can even say he wants to be successful in the circus and study chemistry and all that other stuff for the sole purpose of getting approval from his adoptive father. Now, this may be the first time Bernard called him Mr. because of the intimacy, he probably usually calls him by his first name, you know, because he's like his son, and the title is usually given only for adults. Bernard agrees here that Mike is already an adult, although it was very subtle recognition, it comes from his adoptive father. So to Mike, this means like a whole lot, which explains why he wrote, Oh, Bernard, I want to hear it again. Please don't. I, I, the thing, all right, I'm fine. We'll, we'll get into that in the later section, but gosh darn, could you not say it so creepily? Deduction six, downcast. Watching a sad face can sometimes bring us a dark pleasure. Diary 3. Bernard sent his regards to my beloved little ones. He thought that the wounds on Joker's face looked more like corrosions. His suspicions really hurt me, of course. I did lose a bottle of strong acid. Maybe I'll get another bottle before Bernard finds out about this, um, mismanagement. Alright, we got a lot to unpack here. Now, while Mike was happy because of Bernard's approval, the situation on Joker's side has been heating up pretty badly. Judging from the context of Joker's deductions, Joker was bullied by Sergi and discovered that Natalie was being physically abused by Sergi. He couldn't bear it and he decided he was going to go confront him in person about this. Now, they probably set up a time to meet and because of that, Sergi came up with a plan. He ended up stealing some of Mike's chemicals and due to the fact that Mike was probably well known at the time, it was no surprise that people would understand that he had these chemicals knowing who he is. He ended up attacking Joker, leaving him with a disfigured face and set fire to the evidence. Judging from the fact that Sergi's behavior was not exposed, Joker should have fallen into a certain degree of unconsciousness or something after the incident happened. During this period, Sergi twisted his meeting with Joker in front of Bernard and other members of the circus into a string of lies, which, if you read Joker's deduction, you can see Sergi tends to do regarding Joker a lot. Now this led to the circus further excluding him and alienating Joker. Natalie, forced by Sergi's threats and well aware of what he was capable of, did not tell anyone about the truth, and so Joker was left behind by the circus during a hospitalized stay. He not only lost his face, but he lost his whole reputation and future as well. However, while Sergi had deceived others, he was not able to trick Bernard. Bernard is not a good person based on his past experiences, especially with Wilding. He has good times and bad times, but he definitely knows bad things when he sees them. He's run the circus for many years and is well aware to be careful with trust. He went to visit the injured Joker and found the corrosion marks caused by the acid on his face. Now, of course, he thought this was going to be odd. Being well aware that Mike had this type of acid in his inventory, Bernard decided to approach him asking him about the coincidence. Because of the relationship, Bernard may have just suspected that Mike's things were being used without him knowing, so he came to check. But to Mike, who was a sensitive small boy, Bernard's behavior is more like questioning his character and his ability. And to be fair, Mike actually did lose something, losing a bottle of one of his more expensive and dangerous materials. That negligence would definitely disappoint Bernard if he found out about it. As I've mentioned before, Mike is physically strong, but emotionally, he's a small child. Perhaps out of some reflexive self-preservation, he lied about losing these materials. He also schemed up a way to cover up this mistake, which was to buy a new bottle before Bernard found out that he had lost the current one. We don't know whether or not this plan succeeded, but what we do know is that the relationship between Bernard and Acrobat was slightly stressed after this situation and led to more disputes between the two. Anyway, talking about Mike's position with the Sergi incident, it's likely that Mike didn't really have a partial preference towards either side, being Joker or Sergi. However, as analyzed before, Mike does have a natural love for beautiful and novel things, so it makes sense that he may have a slight preference towards Sergi and Natalie, as they appear to fit that role better than Joker does. Also, Joker was a very important member in the circus, having a role that Mike always dreamed to have. At first, his attitude towards Joker may have been friendly, but as he grows older, it may have turned into more of a competitive streak. Now, Joker seems to be more of an introverted person, while Acrobat is more of an extrovert, and they seem to do very different types of acts, so I find it unlikely that they interacted much. When Sergi joined the circus, judging from Joker's deduction, he did a lot of excessive actions against Joker and made a whole bunch of rumors about Joker in private. Basically, Sergi's a trash guy. With all these lies being said, Joker was gradually alienated from the circus. Therefore, after Joker was injured and hospitalized, Mike may have not been so concerned. In fact, many of the people in the circus probably gloated in darkness about what had happened, corresponding to the deduction which says, watching a sad face sometimes brings us a little dark pleasure. Everyone thought that Joker was a bad guy, so seeing him get something bad happening to him was kind of like karma to them, even though they don't actually know the truth. 
As for the theory where Mike and Sergi jointly harmed Joker, I don't believe this to be the case. To put it simply, it seems that Mike doesn't really know enough about anyone in the situation to really care that much. In Deduction 9, Encore, Mike addresses Natalie and Sergi as the strange couple. If he and Sergi had spoken in private, he would definitely call him by his first name, or at least a title better than that strange couple. Deduction 7, Carnival. Carnival usually means chaos, and chaos means opportunity. Conclusion, shopping list, nighter water, camel dung, milk, and eggs. Now, combined with the previous analysis, Mike and Bernard may have had an argument. After the quarrel, Mike may be angry and not want to participate in the carnival performance, or Bernard may have barred him from participating. On one hand, he's thinking of ways to replenish the water he needs for his ex. On the other hand, out of his childish mentality, he may recall when he used ammonium nitrate to prank Bernard, which resulted in him calling him Mr. Considering he's been on bad terms with Bernard recently, he thinks that maybe this might fix things if he does a prank again. It's a childish idea, but Mike's childish, so I buy it. Anyway, he decides to use the chaos of the circus to go sneak out and buy these items. Or, potentially, he's been barred from participating, so he goes buy them in his free time. However, what Mike didn't expect was that this chaos was not only an opportunity for him, but it was an opportunity for... someone else. <clears throat> Deduction 8. Ending. It's all over. Newspaper clippings. The carnival killer remains a mystery. The public feels that the police did not do a good job and have called for further investigations. I'll go into the specifics of other character lore sections in their own analysis, but for now, Joker tried to return to the circus again, but soon learned that his place was taken by Sergi. What happened that day was interpreted as an unknown fire. Natalie didn't reveal the truth, but instead continued to side with Sergi during this ordeal. Under such pressure, he fell into a state of madness and finally decided to enact revenge against Sergi. Now, this is one interpretation. There are other interpretations that other people caused the fire, but in my personal opinion, I believe it was most likely Joker. When Mike returned to the carnival with the things he brought, the massacre is likely over. He became the only supposed, hint hint, survivor of the circus because of the fight with Bernard. After all, the remaining people died in the massacre. Mike lost his place of residence, place of fate, father figure, and basically everything in his life. Like the title here, the circus performance has finally ended. Deduction 9, Encore. Audiences often say this hoping that the performer will continue performing on stage. Diary 4. I scoured the city's mortuary and found everyone except for the strange new couple. They were scheduled for the grand finale and couldn't sneak out. Joker disappeared after the massacre, or in other words, he may not have been human anymore at the moment. The public was very dissatisfied with the unclear conclusion of the police murder and requested for further investigation. Considering his position, Mike may have been asked by the police to go to the mortuary and identify corpses. It includes crowds of people he doesn't know and crowds of people he does. Every person he considers to be a friend and every family member, even Bernard. As mentioned in the background story of Moonlit River Park, the people were subjected to a blazing fire, which most likely left their bodies badly damaged and even bloody. And if Joker was one of the people involved in the killing, considering he uses a chainsaw in the original version of the game, imagine seeing a body um, torn apart by a chainsaw. Yeah. Anyway, to see people you know come like this is definitely a life-changing shock for Mike. But perhaps for him it became sort of an obsession. Relying on his familiarity with each member, he recognized that the bodies he discovered didn't include Sergi and Natalie among them. He's not gonna become obsessed or anything, don't worry, right? Yeah, sure. Deduction 10, behind the seams. Call their names and make them return to the stage once again. Invitation, enclosed is a photo of a dark-haired woman with a name on the back. Natalie. And here's a note, Natalie is Margaret Margaret's real name when she was in the circus. Natasha is her actual like birth name and she took the name Margaretheria Margareta Margaret I can't pronounce that one after she left, but basically she's female dancer. Okay? Okay. The follow-up investigation was definitely not satisfactory, but considering there were no more leads, they had to end up closing it without being able to find the murderer. As mentioned in the background story of Moonlit River Park, it is officially known that there was a woman who jumped in the river and survived, which is thought to be a female dancer. However, as a result of all the chaos and everything happening, she was never found, and she ended up fleeing and surviving. As for such a result, Mike was not satisfied to find out someone was alive. After learning that there was a woman surviving, Mike guessed that it was Natalie, the trainer, and began a continuous search to find her. Mike continued his search for years, until one day he received an invitation letter from the manor, with a strange image on the back. Natalie. Oop, and that oop. All right, boys, now that's all the deductions. Now we're gonna put it all together. That's right, I got a whole summary background thing here I'm gonna read, and then I'm gonna go over some more additional stuff at the end. 
So Mike Morton is probably an orphan. He was adopted by the circus manager Bernard when he was young and he grew up in the circus. He regarded Bernard as his father and with his permission, Mike began to work as an acrobat. In trying fame, he didn't object to the fervor but found great success. He was deeply entwined into this action and wanted to continue living through this life forever. He continually seeked to improve upon his act and in order to perform his performance, Mike began to study chemicals to add a reactive flair to his performance. After adulthood with Bernard's position, Mike came to contact with the perception methods of ammonium nitrate and bismuth water and basically a bunch of whole dangerous stuff, okay? Okay. Now the circus was welcoming new members at the time and a red-haired smiling clown named Sergi and a trainer Natalie were with some of the new people joining. The conflict between Sergi and Joker grows even worse and Mike continues to study his acrobatic tricks while this is all going on, not really understanding the whole situation between those two. Mike may not have known these people that well, but people did know that Mike had a lot of chemicals. Sergi, being one of these people, decided to steal some and use it to disfigure Joker's face. This probably caused Joker to fall into a period of hospitalization where he couldn't communicate with others, and due to these injuries, Sergi most likely fabricated a lie to distort what had actually happened that day. So the members of the circus began to conclude and alienate Joker as some sort of bad person. As the person in charge, Bernard visited Joker and found that the injury on his face might have been caused by some strong acid. He believed that the cause of this matter was not that simple and decided to conduct further research. In order to further clarify the truth, he checked the chemicals in Mike's collection and Mike believed that the man he trusted the most, Bernard, didn't trust him and some small friction occurred between the two. Perhaps because of this argument, Bernard did not let Mike participate in the performance on the first day of the carnival, although it's also possible that it was done out of his own volition. Regardless as to why Mike left to go to town, he was not there that day, and upon returning, he found maimed faces burning and screaming in agony, some of them familiar, many of them unknown. This was not an enjoyable experience for Mike, strangely enough, and considering all that had happened, the people were not really satisfied with the result and wanted to find out who the killer was. So they ended up having Mike go check out the bodies for further investigation. But Mike was not able to find the body of Sergi and Natalie. It was possible that maybe he told the police about this, but it was not taken seriously. After that, Mike continued to investigate on his own, trying to find out who the real murder of the tragedy that day was. Until one day, an investigation letter was sent to him, and there was a photo of Natasha on the back with black hair. Maybe it was for revenge, maybe it was to find the truth, but regardless as to why, Mike decided to go to the manor. Whew. There you go, guys. You are my dad. You're my dad! Wookie, wookie, wookie! Now, I mentioned on the fifth deduction I was going to go a bit more into this later, and it's later now. So, the relationship between Mike and Bernard. Not pedo, I hope. Okay, so the fifth deduction, I'm just gonna brush over that real fast for you. How, uh, it's called Dear. How people call each other often reflects the degree to which the relationship has developed. Diary 2, I love night or as long as it's mixed with water, even a hot summer day can become refreshing. Bernard's reaction was hilarious and even called me Dear Mr. Mike Morton. Oh, Bernard, I want to hear it again. Next time, I'll make sure to put my cold hands down your collar. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This, this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back. Okay, uh, so in truth, I have seen many different discussions about what this could mean. A lot of them have really creepy conclusions. Okay, uh, now I have no idea why they decided to make this line so detailed. Like, come on, Eddie, so why you gotta do that? Why? 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 Wow. But okay, um, when I see this, the truth is that a lot of bad things pop into my head. Uh, but we should try to address what this could mean to both contexts, to the both extreme possibilities. The first possibility being the most acceptable thing, which is Bernard noticed his conscience after Murrow fled, and he decided to change his mind and become a new man. He adopted young Mike and essentially established a deep uh, familial relationship with him, and as mentioned in his deductions, they're pretty good re-family together and everyone's happy. You know, good, happy stuff. Cool, cool. Now, the other extreme, and this is the most unacceptable thing, is that Bernard is not only a bloodless person, but also has a perverted pedophile streak. Yeah, and he adopted Mike for no-no reasons. There is a strange relationship between the two of them, that is, and please forgive me, it literally pains me to say this, lovers and father and son, which would explain a lot about the hints between the two. 
but for, uh, for the love of goodness, please can this not be the case? Please, 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 please. Uh, all right. Um, proposed between these two possibilities. Let's let's discuss them. Bernard adopted Mike during his midlife, so we can probably assume that during this point in time, he'd be pretty busy with running the circus, so he might not have had a lot of time for Mike. Although he would have grown uh, closer to him later on. Now Mike was adopted, so his impression of his father here should be based on his own personal imagination rather than reality. In other words, when he was young, his relationship with Bernard may not have been as close as it actually was, but he didn't really have a reference for it. They grew closer together around the second induction, and as Bernard said that the size and shape of the bag was dangerous, he took it away from him for being too unsafe, showing that he does have some form of care for Mike. It around this period that Mike and Bernard grew closer together, and that Bernard started to treat him like an actual son. We have to remember that in Wildling's deductions, Bernard was not really the best person, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, as a result, Bernard would be more willing to make his character change and be more of a nicer man, especially considering what had happened in the past. Regardless of the motivation, at the very least from here, I think Bernard does have some real affection for Mike, not a pedo connection, okay? Like, family, f familial connection, okay? Because he takes care of him and treats him as his own. It's also worth noting that none of Mike's deductions are from Bar uh, Bernard's perspective, all are from Mike's perspective, and in Mike's perspective, he does not feel any danger from Bernard and unnecessary fear. So, considering the fact that children are usually very sensitive about this type of thing, and he doesn't normally pick up on any of this, it makes sense that he's probably okay and not being forced to do anything. <laughs> also, more information from tweets, which we'll get into later, actually reveal information about that. As for what's going on in the fifth deduction, <laughs> uh, the space for imagination and discussion is really too big. Personally, I think it's just Mike being a childless idiot who never really grew up and Bernard just interpreting it as being humorous. You have to remember that this is a prank that involves like getting your hands cold, so it makes sense that you'd be touching him to, uh, you know, troll around with him. But Mike obtains his own psychological satisfaction and recognition from being intimate with Bernard in a familial way. He doesn't have a father, he seeks connection, this is connection to him, he's not seeing it as a no-no thing, he's just messing around having fun, okay? He doesn't see it as that type of stuff. This is what I think, at least. And I'll discuss that later when I talk about the tweets, because there's actually some information in there about this which might help. Anyway, now we're going to talk about the character day letters. Ooh, woo. Mike's character day letter. A letter from Arthur Russell. <clears throat> Actually, for Arthur Russell. Forgive me. Dear Mr. Arthur Russell, thank you very much for the investigation report you sent last time. It was a big help regarding the Beast Tamer Natalie, or Margareta Zizel, a dancer. I want to understand her family, what her life was like before joining the Hullabaloo Circus. I'll be away for a while next week. The payment method for the reward will be the same as it was before. No need to mail out the investigation report. I'll visit your residence and receive it later. I'll wait your reply. Loyally yours, Mike Morton. Here we see Mike's research for Natalie, aka Margareta, the female dancer. He appears to be already aware that her new identity seems to be something different and that she has faked her identity in the past, probably due to this new person, Sir Arthur Russell, giving him this information. Now, it's also mentioned in Wilding's character letter that we see Mike, uh, no, <laughs> we see Arthur Russell as well. Now, Wilding's character letter is also written by Mike. It's weird that he doesn't write his own, but whatever. And it says, a letter to Sir Arthur Russell. Dear Sir Arthur Russell, due to some unexpected occurrences, the mission objective has been crossed off the list before your employee arrived. It is a shame, but just as per our contract, under circumstances like these, I cannot pay the remaining reward. After all, nobody could find a complete skull from that burnt pile of ash. Best regards, your loyal client, Mike Morton. Now, this is just my personal opinion, but what I assume is that Mike hired Russell to find out more about the people involved in the incident. Because he says nobody could ever find a complete skull from that burnt pile of ash, I assume he could be talking about Joker due to his facial disfigurement. Acrobat could be saying that there's no point in looking for him because he's already torn apart and unrecognizable. Another potential theory could be that this was the first letter sent and the other one was the second, and in this letter, he's first contacting Russell and he's doubtful that he'll actually be able to find anyone because he thinks they're all dead, even though he didn't see their body. Now, he's saying that he doesn't really trust him, but he later does trust him after he sees results. 
I will also mention more information about Russell uh, right here. Arthur Russell has been mentioned before in Fiona's character letter 2020, and he wrote a letter to her about the suspicious religious activities in Lakeside that could potentially affect their later survey jobs, saying that their surveyor, Volker, had written a report on it. It is currently unknown what type of organization Arthur Russell works for exactly, just that they survey some places and seem to consult Fiona with regards to religious activities. All right, so now that that's with the letters, let's talk about the skins and accessories, and then we'll go to the tweets. Starting with the skins, now I'm only addressing the ones which I think might be related to the lore, so there's other ones, but I just don't think their, their description is important. Bohia, which has the description, people's smiles always cheer him up, and a rowdy crowd always makes him forget all his fears. Here we can see Mike's deep love for the circus. People are enjoyable to him, and he thrives off their affection. Lilac and Scarlet, uh, with the descriptions, it will be ready born. It will be really boring if there is only one type of purple on the costume, and the latter being the brightest color catches the most attention. Now both of these skin descriptions show that Mike's eccentric personality is rather odd, and he likes wearing bright, visible, vibrant colors. He wants to stand out and to be noticed. For accessories, we have Trumpet, which states, Ooh, "I don't really like playing the trumpet during days off." Mike may not like the trumpet, but here we see him working for his dream, being a valuable member in the circus. It could also mean that he tried other stumps, but ultimately realized that juggling was what he enjoyed the most or that he was best at, and he didn't really want to do anything else. Is it tweet time? I think it's tweet time. Now, I know last time I included most of the Mad Eye tweets, but here I'm only going to be including the tweets which I think are related to the lore. You can go check out all of them below if you want. There are some really fun, quirky ones, but again, these are just mostly lore ones. So, as you know, IDV Twitter in Japan likes to post character responses to questions and statements posted by fans. These responses are written as the characters and can reveal some personal information about them. Pascal slash Uranet provides these translations, link to their Twitter and stuff below if you want to check them out. I highly suggest you do! I will only include a few that are related, so be sure to check them out yourself. So for this one, someone tells Mike that they want him to become the pillar of the Hullabaloo Circus, which as we mentioned earlier, is a way of saying that they want them to be important to the circus. And what Mike says is this. He quotes him, first of all, saying, Mike Morton become the pillar of the Hullabaloo Circus. Pillar, hey, you, you know about the Hullabaloo, don't you? Wait, no. What do you know? Could you tell me a little more detail? Now, here we see Acrobat's obsession with a search for the culprit. Even someone just mentioning the circus intrigues him. Furthermore, after reading over a bunch of different theories and translations and stuff, I can say with 100% confidence that the context pillar means the background of the circus. I just specify that again because I see this terminology used so much. As we saw earlier, Joker was the pillar, then Sergi yeeted that position from him. Yeet. Now we have another cute little tweet here. Um, so, okay, so this all right. So someone tweeted Mike say, well, not at Mike, but someone tweeted something saying they wanted to do some uh, NSFW stuff with Mike, some uh, some creepy, some detailed stuff, and um, Mike replied, "I see you won't do anything bad, huh? Okay, maybe I'll drop by. Not." You think I'd be tricked by that? That's definitely something someone bad would say. Too easy, too easy. You won't get me like that. <laughs> okay, but uh, I believe, and I know this is a weird source, but I believe this is good evidence that Mike was not in a pedo relationship with Bernard. You hear me? That's bad. He wasn't doing that, okay? Can't a guy just put his hands down someone's shirt without it being instantly pedo? Come on, guys. Gosh. <laughs> okay, uh, essentially, Mike is not stupid is what he's saying. He's saying, like, dude, I know you're you're being sketch right now. I can I, my sketch radar is popping off. So he he's picking up on that. Also, can I just say really official IDV Twitter, you're replying to people saying they want to do NSFW stuff with your characters. I mean, okay, but like wow. All right, guys, before I call it off, I want to say that there's this awesome person who drew me fan art. They're called the Guillotine. They're on a site called Sketch Sketchers Sun it did Sketchers oh, Sketchers United forgive me I'm an idiot Get to Del Taco they got a new thing called Free 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 Shavaka do Free Shavaka I'm going to put the link down below but look at this it's awesome I love Mad Eye this is awesome you're breathtaking you are breathtaking you know what if I had 
a cheeseburger, I would give you that cheeseburger right now. Unless you don't eat meat, then I would give you a veggie burger. That's how much, that's how awesome you are. You know what? You're a Chad. I love you, okay? I'm signing it off, boys. Thank you very much.